Welcome everyone for the last session on the day. You have already heard about what the new new normal is. You have also heard about how your wealth management business can expand from uh, current. And you have also, Nilkant has also made a case of why you should not invest outside India. And now we are going to present you a case on why you should invest uh, outside India. So a different uh, macroeconomic view and let's see what uh, the new speaker has to offer. Uh, before I begin, uh, you know, introducing the speaker, international investing in India obviously is a new phenomena with RBI allowing up to $250,000 uh, LRS per person per year. Uh, the amount of LRS uh, last year for fiscal 21-22 has been close to $750 million uh, US dollars with uh, March 2022 run rate being $100 million a month. So we are looking at one one point one 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 point two billion dollars a year going out in um, international markets, uh, primarily uh, you know in investing. Uh, with that uh, numbers in mind, let me invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Ritika Mankar. She is a strategist with uh, BCA Research, and as all of you know, BCA Research is a leading global research provider since 1949. Uh, she's a part of global investment strategy team headed by uh, Peter. Uh, Berzin. She is a sell side veteran and was director with Ambit Capital, where she was leading the macroeconomist team for over a decade. She is a trained macroeconomist, a CFA charter holder, and in the past have uh, been the director at CFA Society India, apart from doing a short stint with the uh, Ministry of uh, Finance. Uh, over to you, Ritika. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see, I have to adjust the mics downwards after BD spoke. Uh, I know, I know. You know, we've had a we've had a fairly interesting day ahead of us. Uh, all thanks to the work put in by CFA Society India. Uh, the tenor for the day, the the tone for the day was set nicely by Navneet, who gave us very very interesting food for thought. Uh, we had Karan speak to us after that. We had Larry speak to us. Uh, Neelkant Mishra gave us some brilliant food for thought as well. Uh, somebody who I look up to a great deal. Uh, and I know this is now the fourth or the fifth session of the day. A degree of diminishing marginal utility has set in, I can tell from the faces. Uh, but let me assure you, we're going to fight this diminishing marginal utility. I'm going to make sure that this session is great fun. Uh, this session is very, very focused, and the session is short. Uh, and to make it even better, we'll keep it as interactive as possible because we have a nice Q&A lined up uh, that BD will be moderating for us. Uh, so without further ado, let's, let's kick start this presentation. Uh, like I promised, I'm going to keep it quick, I'm going to keep it snappy. Uh, before we get into the specifics, let's just set up the stall here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let me just quickly give you a sense of what we will be covering over the course of the next 60 minutes. What we will be focusing on is a fairly simple idea, if you think of it. As of today, the US accounts for some of the largest corporates that exist globally by revenue. And this is reflected quite clearly in the fact that any global equity index, uh, the US accounts for 62% of the weightage. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's not always been the case that the US had a 62% weightage on MSCI, ACWI, for instance. Uh, the number has literally grown over the last decade. This number was close to about 40% just 10 years ago. So the simple question that we're going to ask ourselves is, will the next few years see more of the same, or are we at an inflection point? That's the simple thought process that we'll try to understand. Why is this thought process important? Why should wealth management industry professionals be on top of this thought process? I think the simple reason why it's important to have a thought process here is simply because, uh, so when I speak to wealth management and wealth industry professionals, particularly CEOs of large Mumbai-based businesses in this sector, everybody tells me that savers from all walks of life now want to have international equity exposure. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, a nascent trend, it's a new trend, but it's growing exponentially, and no wealth industry professional can afford to not have a view on global equity markets, and what I hope to do is equip you with that over the next 60 minutes. Uh, very quickly, who will benefit from this conversation? I think two sets of people. 
Uh, number one, like I said, is obviously wealth industry professionals for the reasons that I highlighted to you. Number two, I'd say, you know, I can see a lot of us here are fairly young. Uh, we're new to the financial services industry itself. Uh, what I hope to do over the next 60 minutes is plant a seed of questioning, uh, to plant a seed of not wanting to linearly extrapolate what's in front of you. I've been an analyst myself. I've worked under very tough timelines. And I know when I'm under a deadline and I need to focus something, I you'd resort to linear extrapolation. I just drag that Excel sheet down. Uh, I hope, I hope I can inculcate in you uh, the spirit of not doing that and really questioning and constantly looking out for inflection points. Uh, so with that established, let's dive straight in. So somebody who taught me structured thinking, structured writing, said that the human mind picks up something most easily if you break it up into four simple parts. The situation, the complication, the question, and the answer. And that's exactly how we've structured this presentation that we'll be running through. Section one will focus on the situation, which is establishing that the US is the superstar of global equity markets today. Uh, the, section, the second section will establish the complications. Uh, plant some seeds of doubt in your minds as to why that stardom that the US enjoys today might come under a degree of pressure over the next few years. Uh, number three and number four sections will focus on the question and answer and also give you actionable investment ideas that you can motivate basis this thematic. And if I've done a bad job at this SCQA or the situation complication question and answer, then we've got BD waiting on the sidelines who has more questions and answers so that we make sure we do a good job. Uh, so let's, let's kick start with the situation. So I think what's relatively clear is that the US is the star protagonist of global equity markets. And the reason for this is quite important. Reason number one, it is the largest economy of the world. Uh, so I was looking at the data. For the last century and more, the US has been the largest economy of the world. Uh, and it's likely to do so, uh, likely to be able to defend this title quite successfully over the next few years as well. Even though China is growing fast, it's going to be able to maintain a two trillion lead on the uh, Chinese economy. Distinct from being a large economy, which is something that excites economists, it's also a strategist's or an investor's dream because it off also offers lots and lots of large uh, listed corporates that are extremely liquid. Remember, countries like China and Germany are counter examples, massive economies, but very, very small stock markets as compared to the size of the economy. So a Japan, so for instance, a Germany or a China uh, excites economists, but doesn't e excite investors as much, simply because it doesn't offer that depth in terms of its equity markets. And because of this deadly combination, of a large economy and a large investable universe of stocks, uh, what you've basically got is that the US has a star role to play when you look at the top 20 companies globally by revenue. So what you can see, ladies and gentlemen, in front of you uh, is the top 20 companies by revenue globally. And you can see quite easily by just gleaning at this table that 10 of those 20 companies today are American. Uh, Walmart and Amazon are right on top with a $500 billion revenue, which is really, really impressive by all uh, benchmarks. Uh, and you can also see that, uh, and, and just hold on to this thought, we'll come back to this later. It's also really interesting to note that only two European countries are represented on this table. Uh, there's uh, three non-China Asian countries on this table. India is missing. And after the US, the only other country which has a decentish footprint, uh, nowhere close to what the US has, but decentish footprint is China. And you know, you might say that, hey, hang on a second, what's the big deal? Isn't the US, hasn't the US always been as imposing a power uh, to reckon with on global equity markets? The answer is no. Because if you look at this chart here, you can see that even by US's historical standards, the fact that it's able to send 10 companies to that top 20 list is pretty remarkable. 
Uh, there was only four companies just 10 years ago who, were, uh, ha who, who had revenues of more than $200 billion. Uh, and just, just to you know, drive home the point of how meaningful it is for 10 American companies to have $200 billion plus revenues, I put that chart there. So essentially, the combined revenue of the top 10 US companies today is comparable to India's nominal GDP. Uh, so when you make career choices, make smart ones, uh, it just gives you a sense of how big the US as an economy is, as a market is to work with. And I guess just to, just to round up the situation chart, I thought this was an important chart to look at. Uh, distinct from a large economy, a uh, large listed investable universe with lots of liquid names, I think the other thing the US obviously has got going for itself is tremendous performance history since 2008. So the US has outperformed global markets by about 200% since 2008. Uh, and it's worth noting that the sales per share expansion uh, in MSCI US as compared to the world has been one of the primary drivers of this outperformance. So guys, we've established how the US is the superstar that it is and why it is the superstar that it is. And now we're all ready to start questioning this situation that we've established with a bunch of complications. So this is, this is a, a really interesting point uh, my team came across. Uh, and it only came through because you know we were a bunch of economists who were also CFA charter holders. Uh, what we did was we started looking at companies in the US quite closely. And what we realized was that while everybody is focused on the Twitter accounts of you know, the founders of some of the largest US companies, and everybody is completely enraptured by that, lo and behold, there's something quite wrong in the talent pool, as I call it, of the US stock market. Uh, by the talent pool, I essentially am referring to the mid-sized companies. So if we define the top 10 companies in America as companies with revenues of more than $200 billion, let's define the mid-sized companies as companies with revenues of about $50 to $200 billion. So there's something quite amiss when you focus on the US economy and what's happening in the mid-sized companies. Uh, there is a clear stagnation there. There is, there is not a thriving kind of situation because not only is the percentage of mid-sized firms stagnated over the last decade, as you can see on this slide here, uh, but also the revenue share accounted for by mid-sized firms is coming down. Uh, and you might say that, you know, why, why does this matter? Maybe this is a global trend. Maybe all large economies are going through this simply because they're so large. So let's quickly do a check on the numbers for China as well. And you can see quite clearly uh, that, so US is a $23 trillion economy. China is a $17 trillion economy. And even in China, the situation is not at all like what it is in America. Uh, the mid-sized cohort, the core firms, uh, the firms that tend to supply the large firms of tomorrow are actually doing really well, both in terms of the ratio as a proportion of total number of firms, as well as the revenue proportion. And the reason why you know, all of this matters, uh, so I know that a lot of uh, the people here in this room are men, and Indian men like to understand finance, and they also love to talk about cricket, right? So if I was to use a cricketing analogy to explain the importance of why you need to have a thriving mid-sized firms ecosystem, uh, in the 1990s, the Indian cricket squad was fabulous. This was the first time the Indian cricketing team started doing well. And the reason why that happened, ladies and gentlemen, was because in the 80s, schools in our city were creating some great talent, which eventually became the Sachin Tendulkars of the 1990s. Uh, so what this slide is explaining to you is that in the US too, all the top 10 companies that we were talking about that have revenues of more than $200 billion today, 10 years ago, were really tiny companies, were close to about a $50 billion revenue mark. And essentially what that tells you is there are no lateral entries into the top revenue club of the world. You have to work your way. You have to start at a good point. And if you don't have a large enough talent pool, there's a chance that fewer large companies will be generated 10 years from now.
let's let's get to the second complication uh, let's let's go back to economics 101 we all did it at different times of our lives uh, and remember what we were taught was there are broadly two extreme market structures uh, there's perfect competition where you know you have a large number of producers uh, selling homogeneous products uh, practically and you have a monopoly structure where you have a single seller selling something really unique which cannot be replicated uh, oligopolies is something that's closer to the monopoly structure than it is to the perfect competition structure now oligopolies are a good thing for an economy uh, it's it's something that makes economists investors and strategists happy uh, because if you have oligopolistic businesses, they have large market shares, they have juicy margins, and this makes everybody happy. Uh, and you can see that uh, it, is, it is a situation that the US has reached where they've got too much of this good thing. Because, like you can see in this bar chart here, the revenue share accounted for by the top 10 companies in America is dangerously high now. Uh, these 10 companies alone account for 20% of the revenue that all of the listed universe in the US uh, generates, which is an unhealthy number. Uh, I'll get to a, in a minute why. Also, you can see that even in terms of sheer numbers, uh, it looks like as compared to about the 10 number of $200 billion plus revenue companies that the US has as of today, it should have probably had something like a six or seven to fall in line with the global trend. You know, just to illustrate uh, the extent to which market power is concentrated in America, uh, focus on this bar chart here. What this basically does is looks at the revenue share accounted for by the largest guy in a sector. And we've done that for the US and we've done that for China. And you can see that even as compared to a country like China, which is known to champion you know, single big guys in sectors, even compared to them, the US tends to have the largest uh, producer in any sector corner a disproportionately high proportion of the revenue pie. So for financials, IT, and consumer discretionary, the largest revenue generator in each of those sectors in the US accounts for anything from 15 to 25 percent of the sector's revenue. And you know, you might say that, Ritika, uh, profit margins, uh, pricing power are a good thing. Investors are always looking for it. Why, can is, why is this problematic? The reason why it's problematic is simply because if you have too much of it, there is a high probability that uh, there will be regulatory interventions and you could be at the receiving end of antitrust activity. And this seems highly likely in the US today, simply because if you look at that line chart there, you can see that 60% of the US population is deeply dissatisfied with the influence that large American corporates have today. Uh, and this in turn means that there is a political pressure for regulators to go after the really big guys. And for your and my purpose, I mean, distinct from the politics of it, if this does happen, it basically means you and I can't drag our Excel sheets forward. Uh, we can't re uh, replicate the revenue growth rates you saw over the last 10 years, over the next 10 years. So we've established the complication as well. Uh, let's, let's try and tease out actionable investment conclusions, uh, because that's, that's what we are here for. Uh, before I get into the specifics of it, uh, I'll, I'll highlight two to three thought processes that are important to bear in mind before we get to the final you know, actionable investment ideas. The first one has to do with something I know all of you are thinking, but not saying it out loud because I've got the microphone and you guys have to listen. Uh, what you are probably thinking is that, you know what, Ritika, it sounds a bit insane for me to believe that the US will not have the dominating role that it has in global equity markets 10 years from now. Uh, China has political problems. Japan is stagnating. Europe has problems of innovation. And you know we were discussing this earlier in the day. One of the speakers was, at the end of the day, the US has a fabulous property rights system 
a good education system and is a kind of melting pot that attracts international talent. So how is it possible uh, that the US will lose its leadership position or it's the peak of its leadership position is probably here. Uh, to answer this question, uh, I'll, I'll show you these uh, two charts. And frankly, looking at these charts also you know, gave me more conviction about what we were talking about. If you were to look at uh, what that top 20 list I showed you right at the outset 20 years ago, you'd see that Europe was pretty much where America is today. So you can see that Europe, European companies were accounting for more than 40% of the names on that list two decades ago. Um, and you know, back then, if we'd had a wealth conference and we were having this conversation and I told you that, you know what, uh, Europe is going to be displaced. Uh, not only will China become bigger, uh, not only will America become bigger, but if I was to tell you that Taiwan and Korea, two small Asian island countries, literally so small island countries, will have a bigger footprint on that top 20 list than European countries do 20 years hence, you'd probably think you know, this was blasphemy. It wasn't possible. But cut to today, ladies and gentlemen, and look at that chart there. Uh, BP and Mercedes-Benz, two European companies, which were super large in 2001. Uh, their revenues have you know, barely grown over the last 20 years. And today, one Korean company and one Taiwanese company, we all know which one that is, has greater revenues than Mercedes-Benz and BP. So the key point I want to drive home, especially uh, for the young finance professionals here, is that everything in finance is about being inorganic. It's about upsets. And rarely, rarely is it about linear extrapolations. And you know, just to again round up what we've been discussing so far, very, very quickly, what we've been discussing is that uh, there are reasons to believe that the US may not be able to dominate that top 20 list as aggressively as it is currently doing over the next few years. And this basically opens up the probability of other countries, particularly China, uh, stepping into the place created by the US. And distinct from the factors that we discussed, I think that's, that's a macro bar chart that a lot of us should look at because I was myself surprised when my team pulled this up. Over the next five years, not only will growth in the US slow as compared to its own historical standards, but growth in a lot of Asian economies uh, will be higher than what the US will be generating over the next five years. So it's a double slowdown in a sense that US growth is slower than its own history and is lower than what other Asian economies will be doing. And before we go to the last slide uh, of, of the day, not just this presentation, uh, one, one last slide to do a quick check on India. You'd ask, you know, how is, how is India faring in all of this? We've discussed so many things about larger economies. How is India holding up? Uh, so I have some good news to deliver, but also some bad news. The good news, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is captured by this bar chart here, which is the mid-sized firm's ecosystem is doing all right in India. And remember, like we discussed with our cricketing analogy, this is important because it tells you that there is a possibility that Sachin Tendulkar's and Apple's will be born out of India over a period of time. Uh, but the bad news is, as usual, in the fine print of that bar chart. And I don't know how many of you can see it to zero down on it. We've had to define mid-sized firms very, very differently in India as compared to the US. So in India, I've had to define mid-sized firms as firms with revenues of 10 to $50 billion only. So this means that we will generate bigger companies than what we have, but they won't be comparable uh, to the top 20 league. Uh, because remember, if you look at that table there, which shows the top 10 companies in India by revenue, uh, some of our largest companies, uh, as per 2021 data, are barely reaching 70 billion. So even if 70 billion grows at a higher growth rate, uh, it can't catch up with the 200 billion, even if it grows at a 5% growth rate. So that's, that's just a quick update on India, since you might be thinking on those lines. And I think now we're ready uh, you know, to call uh, this entire discussion uh, to uh, tie it up. 
into actionable investment ideas. So you can see uh, what we are in fact suggesting is that the US will lose its lead in terms of the number of companies it sends to that top 20 club of companies by revenue globally. Uh, the green stars indicate the number of $200 billion plus companies that are located in different parts of the world. So the downward arrow is something that we've discussed uh, fairly deeply uh, during, during this presentation. Uh, where will the increase come through? Now that's, that's the interesting question that we'll spend some bit of time on now. Uh, and let's break it up into a couple of themes so that it's easy for us to remember perhaps and later think over. Uh, theme number one is obviously China. I think what's relatively clear is that China will slow from its current levels of growth, no doubt about it. It's hit its peak population already. But remember, it'll still be a growth rate that's higher than a lot of other large economies. And today, China is the second largest economy of the world. I know that regulatorily, at this point in time, it looks like the Chinese dispensation does not want large tech giants. You know, it's going after them with a regulatory crackdown. But I think it's quite imaginable for China to spawn large financial sector companies or even industrial sector companies, because these will be fully in line with the political requirement of common prosperity. And moreover, uh, a lot of you would have put two and two together by now and realized that unlike America, China has a rich talent pool of mid-sized firms that have the potential to become really large firms 10 years down the line. So theme number one is, of course, China looks like a place that could get a few stars from the US and pull it under its name. A second theme that probably will play out uh, to a large extent over the next decade is industrialization. Uh, people's demand for the kind of goods that the world will be consuming will change. In the short term, like Neelkan Mishra was telling us, there'll be a switch from goods to services. But in the longer term, the kind of goods we con consume will change. Uh, and where will these be, be produced as a second wave of industrialization comes through? These goods will be produced in any country that can produce at a low cost, uh, has a high degree of capability on the robotics front, and can do a lot of autom automatized manufacturing. And it seems like China, Korea, Japan, and to some extent even Germany have a lead on this kind of manufacturing capability. So that's theme number two, something that could help these four countries that currently have just one green star under them potentially add maybe one more star. Uh, another theme is obviously tech. Uh, now, it so happens that things like Lenovo, things like Taiwan Semiconductors gets classified under information technology. Uh, and my sense is that you know, this is going to be an important sector going forward. Uh, and obviously, a country like Taiwan is best positioned from the perspective of that theme. And also, interestingly, China. Uh, on a whole lot of metrics that we checked all these countries on, both those countries have the capability of growing their footprint globally in the IT space. Uh, and perhaps the last theme that I'll highlight in this context is commodities. Now, we don't know if there will be another commodity super cycle over the next five to 10 years or not. But if at all there was to be one, uh, it looks like Germany and UK are two countries that could benefit simply because a lot of the large oil and energy producing companies actually hail from these two countries. Uh, so you know, just to summarize uh, our presentation and to highlight the investment conclusion, I think it seems almost certain that the global epicenter of big firms, which currently is firmly positioned in the United States of America, will slowly but surely drift eastwards over the next decade. And hopefully, this gives you an interesting thought process uh, to not only resist linear extrapolations in the future, but also talk to your clients quite openly about a strategic thought process on the global equity markets front. So with that, I'll call my presentation to a close and request BD to take over in case I've done a bad job at the q and Picking up from where uh, you left about the epicenter, prior to COVID, everybody uh, meant that the world is flat. And suddenly, you know, in COVID world, the borders were no longer flat or no longer accessible. Uh, and the world again moved uh, inwards. Uh, and most of the companies you mentioned as part of the 
you know, US uh, economy, the epicenter, they have operations across the world. Mm -hmm. So does the movement of these companies from US to some other market, does it really matter from an investment standpoint? Right. That's a really interesting question, BD, and this is how I'd position it. I think uh, if you look at uh, the US names uh, that are able to make it to that top 20 list, you'll see that uh, two sectors have a degree of prominence. Uh, one sector that's obviously very prominent is IT. Another one is consumer discretionary. Right. And a third one is healthcare. So I'd say that you know, from a longer term perspective, it's possible that there is a reallocation within IT uh, in America to say something like China, uh, right. to something like Taiwan. Uh, so maybe IT weightages stay constant. But there is a reallocation into, in terms of who the largest uh, companies in that space are away from the US to some extent and towards Taiwan, towards China. Uh, and secondly, I'd say, you know, on a related uh, note, healthcare and US healthcare companies, I think those are the most vulnerable potentially to move out of that list. Uh, and that's, that's the space that other companies will probably step into. Sure. There is a lot of chatter about U.S. recession. I mean, the GDP has been contracting for almost uh, two quarters. Fed is in action. Has the recession already happened and we don't know it? Is it about to happen? And if it happens, what is the impact on India? Right. Uh, so uh, I know a lot of the speakers before me have, um, you know, highlighted the fact that things aren't looking so great at this point in time. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we share a slightly different view from that perspective. Uh, so like, like uh, I was mentioning earlier to you, uh, my colleague Peter Berezin, who is the global investment strategist, looks at this aspect more closely. Uh, and he always tells me two interesting thought processes on the recession question, uh, which I think are very relevant here. Point number one that's worth highlighting is that while US GDP growth has contracted for two consecutive quarters, uh, there's no two questions about that, it's important to note that the jobs market, the labor market in the US is red hot right now. Uh, the last, you know, practically every major recession in the US has been accompanied by a major increase in unemployment. The 2008 recession, unemployment rates went up from 4% to 8%. Uh, and this time, you have a sub-4% unemployment rate, which is getting compressed uh, as time passes. Furthermore, uh, at this point in time in the US, for every unemployed person, there are 1.8 job vacancies. So the point he makes is that it doesn't even seem likely that unemployment will move up in the US anytime soon. So that's reason number one why we tend to believe that it's potentially not a proper recession. Uh, because the jobs market is doing really well. And the second piece that's worth highlighting, BD, is that, uh, so pre-pandemic days, I remember I was having a cup of tea with a senior bureaucrat in Delhi uh, and discussing things about Indian national accounts and how they are calculated. And he quite candidly admitted that, I don't know why the market responds so much to the first data point that comes out, because the first data point is an estimate it has a large component that is calculated and isn't based on actual data because you can't have all the actual data then. And again, on, I mean, this problem also exists in the US. And again, my uh, colleague Peter estimates that there's a 35% probability that the Q2 US GDP print will be revised upwards into positive territory by the time you get the final revision. Uh, so that's, that's interesting food for thought on, you know, potentially everybody's overblowing the whole recession narrative. And just to be clear, I mean, in India, usually we grow at about uh, 8 to 10 percent <laughs> in real terms, and U.S. is growing maybe about 2, 3 percent. When we say recession, are we talking about economic contracting? Or are we talking about lowering down the growth rate? Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. In the Indian context, I don't think there is a risk of neither the nominal uh, GDP growth amount nor the real GDP growth right. amount sinking into negative territory at this point in time. And in US? Uh, US, like I said, we've had two first estimate prints which are contracting, uh, but we think that the second print could be revised into positive territory. Sure. Fed is working a lot these days. Right. They've been busy. 
they have already done uh, two uh, interest rate hikes and correspondingly i think every central bank is in action uh, eu for the first time in maybe a decade or so has uh, you know uh, put up their interest rates what do you think is the action plan for next maybe 12 months or so 2023 should we be worried about what they are going to do or should we be clear that this is what they are going to do right uh, so i think uh, currently the fed funds rate is at 2.25 to 2.5% uh, the market expects that this rate will go up to 3.5 3.4% by the beginning of 2023 uh, but the market also expects that this rate will fall as the rest of 2023 transpires i think with respect to our expectations uh, we think that that 3.4 number is correct uh, but from there on we shouldn't expect a reduction there's a good chance that the fed has to continue hiking right. rates uh, and this is not necessarily again going back to the recession question not necessarily bad for us growth because we think that the neutral rate uh, the rate that doesn't uh, you know cause pain for the economy the neutral rate for the us economy is far higher than what a lot of people expect uh, so even it's probably somewhere between 3.5 to 4% so even if you're at 3.4% you're just reaching a neutral rate which is right. not as scary as you know a lot of people think it is and will that have some more impact on the currency market as we see it i mean us versus other currency and i mean talking about indian rupee mm -hmm. indian rupee versus dollar is a different story to tell and indian rupee versus rest of the world currencies have a different story to tell right right so i think uh, again uh, in the short term uh, it's hard to tell but from a longer term perspective uh, you know the global investment strategy group is of the view uh, that the dollar is severely overvalued uh, and there is a chance that what you've seen so far could change going forward and just to be clear longer term means 10 years no it means more than one year <laughs> in this context okay now we talked about uh, you know the revenue landscape for us uh, uh, market would you have some similar metrics for indian markets versus us so that it becomes easy to compare from what we are looking at sure so uh, in my previous avatar when i used to work in the indian sell side we had actually pulled up some numbers about what the scale of the indian uh, corporate landscape from a revenue perspective is and it's obvious uh, i mean it was kind of expected but let's put numbers to it what we figured was if you define ultra small companies as companies with revenues of 0 to 400 million rupees that's about 0 to 5 million dollars or uh, 28% of listed companies uh, were in the ultra small category so that's a pretty large number and that ratio was rising Uh, and even in the unlisted space the good news was that the proportion was coming down, coming down. but the proportion as a level was at near 50% uh, so you know long long way to go in terms of indian corporates and their ability to scale up some of the numbers which you mentioned on the you know presentation earlier that us gdp is close to about 23 trillion dollars mm -hmm. but the us msci us company revenues are close to about 15 trillion dollars that's close to about 64 65% which uh, these companies contribute mm -hmm. contrary to that uh, i mean in indian landscape our gdp is close to about 3 trillion maybe 3 3.2 and the revenues for the you know companies put together is about 1 trillion so we are roughly one third where us is two thirds yeah. where do you think that gap is right so i think uh, uh, I'll, i'll highlight some thoughts on this and i'm sure you'll also have some thoughts on this uh, given your intensive experience uh, you know in investing in india uh, here are here are two reasons why i think uh, indian companies suffer from a scale problem uh, number one i think uh, the heterogeneity right uh, so a lot of people try to think of india as say an economy like the us but i always think it's an economy that's more like europe because it's highly heterogeneous and tastes and preferences change every 100 kilometers so you know say a horlicks that sells in one part of india has no acceptance practically in another part of india uh, so that's reason number one why you know a consumer staples company cannot have scale in the indian context and i find it quite interesting that say if you compare india and france two countries with similar nominal mm -hmm. gdps uh the largest consumer staples company in france is nearly 10 times the size of say unilever's 
Yeah. And that's probably because tastes and preferences are so divergent and India is very heterogeneous. And I think the other issue is probably got to do with the regulatory cholesterol. And I'm using a word that uh, Manish Sabharwal of Team Lease had told me about, that any company in India needs to comply with a whole range of regulatory requirements, which probably are a problem uh, from the perspective of rapid scaling up. Uh, and which is why I also find it interesting that some of the largest companies in India from a revenue perspective tend to be companies that have, uh, you know, chairman or CEOs who are almost like patriarchs who've been around for two to three decades. So take an LNT, for example, take an ITC, for example, take a company from the house of Tata's. These companies have probably become large companies because you've had stable leaders who've been able to understand the regulatory landscape nicely. Uh, but your thoughts, your thoughts, BD. No, so Look, India, the first trillion dollars of economy for India took about 67 years. But the second trillion only came in like nine years. And the third trillion came in maybe less than five years or five and a half years. We are talking here from three trillion to six trillion. The composition for the first trillion was very, very different from the composition of sure. second trillion or the third trillion. And as we juggle between a manufacturing-based economy or a consumer-based economy or a services-driven economy, I think these things will change. Sure. You know, the models like... Amazon and Flipkart, they were there 20, 25 years ago as well. But because of the lack of internet or lack of telephone connectivity, they were not able to scale. With a conducive environment, with ease of business going through, I mean, things can happen faster than what we uh, think otherwise. I mean, you give uh, a $60 billion company, which you mentioned is the largest, if you give them, give them conducive environment and enough room to grow, they can also obviously do uh, you know, wonders in a short span of time. The only difference is a $200, million, $200 billion company growing at 2% and a $60 billion company growing at 10%. I mean, the time is of essence. Right. Uh, if we don't have time, obviously, uh, we probably won't reach there. But, you know, going forward, a composition from 3 to 6 will be very, very different from uh, what's there. And classic example is in your securities market, you know, where the new age discount brokers have sort of suddenly come in last maybe 10 years sure. and have become sort of number one players versus the traditional brokers who have been there for last, you know, maybe 40, 50 years, right? right? And markets have changed. So technology, wherever technology is possible, I think these things are uh, changing uh, from, from that perspective. Sure. Uh, since we are talking about global investment strategy, while we wait for more questions over there, on an average we have seen, and this is not, you know, a tested number, but maybe less than 1% to 2% or maybe as high as 5% is the global uh, allocation which people have. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I leave apart the crypto, which I don't think is considered as part of allocation, uh, a direct exposure, now that the limit has increased, is, is less than 5%. Mm -hmm. And if that less than 5% is what we are talking about, mm -hmm. is that really going to move the needle given that you have to choose a country mm -hmm. which is not growing as fast as India? You're right. I mean, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I'll answer it in two ways. Uh, number one, uh, like we figured out through the course of this uh, conversation, uh, hopefully, there is actually very little relationship between the size of a country and the kind of companies it spawns from a returns perspective. I mean, uh, US, Japan being one uh, side of the spectrum, China, Germany being another side of the spectrum. Uh, so, you know, that, that's point number one. Uh, the second uh, point I'd probably uh, highlight on this front uh, is essentially that uh, you could probably allocate a higher amount to this entire global equity portfolio. So remember 20 years ago when you'd have a conversation as a wealth industry professional with your client and you'd say, sir, 40% equity may dalye, you'd get massive pushback saying that, you know, this is not happening. Yeah. Uh, and probably this is that moment for global equity exposure where we need to have that conversation with our clients saying that for reasons of diversification and maximization of co uh, risk adjusted returns, consider a higher allocation than 5%. Now, assuming I convince the client for a higher allocation in global equity, but events like COVID, which are as recent as maybe last two years, mm. where everybody moves in the same direction, mm. events like Russia or, you know, uh, Ukraine conflict or what's happening in China, Taiwan, the events which have that much greater impact on the world as a whole, mm. the doll economy is moved together. Mm. Nobody performs. I mean, even though, mm. uh, you know, I think Neil Kent mentioned when 
there are days when decades happen and there are decades <laughs> when days happen. Right. When events like these happen, mm -hmm. does diversification really matter? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole fundamental models of diversification matters. Mm -hmm. Do they really work? I mean, here again, I'll, I'll highlight that uh, the moment you are a little bit patient with your investments, diversification benefits come to you. So if you're sitting in March 2020, uh, and you see what's happening to all asset classes and they're crashing, clearly, I mean, diversification won't save won't you. But if you're looking at a time horizon that ranges from, say, March 20 to March 2021, diversification can clearly maximize your risk-adjusted returns. Now, since you are making the presentation to the charter holders, I expected a question on, from finance. And the question is, we have been comparing company on the basis of revenue. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we be doing market cap weighted or PE based, which are different for different economies? Right. Uh, so that's an absolutely valid point. Uh, I think uh, what, what we were trying to do in this exercise is as follows. Uh, number one, we chose revenue as a variable to focus on simply because it's not as volatile as, say, market cap. Uh, market cap can be fleeting, and one would like to think that revenue is a variable that influences market cap. So you rather focus on the variable that influences the final variable than focus on the final variable itself. Uh, number two, yes, we could have focused on profits as well. But remember, if you're looking at things from a top-down perspective, uh, and this is a mistake I find so many strategists make, there is really no correlation. There shouldn't be any correlation between GDP growth and earnings growth. Earnings is a function of revenue growth and costs pressures. And so if you want to look at things from a top-down perspective, it makes sense to focus on revenues rather than profits. But yes, uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, we get a great client response to this report. And there's a sequel basis profits that we can uh, discuss. And since you talk about great companies, one of the questions we have are great companies also great stocks. Right. Shouldn't we be differentiating between good companies and good stocks? Absolutely, uh, that's an extremely fair point. Uh, but it's worth noting that if you can broadly identify a basket of big companies, then there's a good probability you're zero down on, zeroing down on performing companies. Because even those 20 companies that we were looking at, uh, just last night I thought of, I knew this question would come, which is why I checked. Uh, the combined weightage that these 20 companies have in MSCI ACWI is 10%. 10 to 11%. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that if you can identify the broad direction using top-down strategic thinking, you can then apply bottom-up stock picking to identify the performers. Uh, but even if you get the basket right using macro and strategy, you're in a good position from a returns perspective. Sure. You mentioned there are quite a few inflection points for markets in general over the next maybe uh, 12 to 24 uh, months. Uh, are there any specific inflection points you would like to talk about or highlight from an Indian slash global context? All right. Uh, so this, this is a tricky question, uh, but let me, let me take a moment to think of this. I think uh, I have to give you a good example, uh, given that, you know, I'm trying to champion the cause of not dragging Excel sheet cells downwards. Uh, I think one, one, you know, qualitative example that I can think of from the realm of geopolitics is uh, something to do with the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, so I remember in February 2022, when this whole war became known uh, to the markets, a lot of people jumped to the conclusion, uh, simply because India was buying oil from Russia, saying that, you know what, India has chosen to cleave towards Russia uh, in this war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and that was, you know, the linear extrapolation thinking to do. Uh, but my thought process on that is that, you know, distinct from the here and now, distinct from the tactical things that India does, on a structural time horizon, India will cleave towards the U.S. And this is because this works for India in the subcontinent, in the South Asian subcontinent, yeah. given its geopolitical interests. And it also works for America, given its aspirations in the Asian continent. Uh, much like what Navneet was highlighting, that, you know, the U.S. needs a democratic anchor in the Asian Asia. continent to maintain influence. So that's one uh, example I can think of. You mentioned China as one of the places where one should look for the next set of, uh, you know, rising stars, the so-called uh, big companies are there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
is there a particular view which you have on Chinese tech companies? Uh, I mean, given that there has been some uh, uh, triggers about regulatory crackdown or otherwise. Uh, I mean, we used to talk about East India Company, but you know, the new tech giants are the you know uh, governments uh, which control parts of the world. Uh, right. So I think uh, when we were writing this report, and uh, there's there's another strategy at BCA called the China Investment Strategy, and when we were having this conversation, this was a very big pushback that we got from them, saying that, you know, it seems like uh, it's going to be difficult for China to spawn large tech companies for political reasons, not because the country doesn't have innovative or scale capabilities, and perhaps that's a fair, uh, you know, assessment. Uh, and like I was saying, maybe if not in the tech space, financials uh, and also industrials are two sectors where uh, China already has large companies uh, which can become quite big. Uh, it has capability. Uh, and number three, you know, this is, this is a space where more large companies on a global scale can be accommodated. So I'd say if not tech, uh, then Chinese financials and perhaps even industrials uh, could become really big companies in the long run. You would have noticed that large part of Asian entrepreneurs or families or businesses are mostly family owned. Mm -hmm. I mean, majority of these businesses have more than maybe 75 to 90% of family holdings. They usually never list uh, their businesses. Uh, and if they are list listed mm -hmm. only because of the, you know, uh, regulatory mandate, they have to obviously bring uh, minimum 25% uh, public right. shareholding. Uh, and that obviously emotional attachment with your business mm -hmm. is not so much in you know US or some of the other countries. So is it quite possible that there are companies far bigger mm -hmm. or with far bigger potential than uh, what you have in US, mm -hmm. but they are not listed uh, purely because of the family ownership uh, you know uh, culture which we have in Asia per se, not right. just India but across Asia. Uh, right. And as and when they list, and the classic example is uh, Saudi Aramco. I mean it just listed and it's there in you know, top 10. I mean, the whole right. country's, uh, uh, you know, GDP itself is lower than, <laughs> market cap is much lower right. than what that is. Right. Uh, will that be the case? I mean, with with uh, Government of India trying to divest and LIC obviously listing and so many other companies in the pipeline, right. is that possible? Right. So, uh, two, two quick thoughts on the point that was made. Uh, number one, I think great observation. Uh, I think indirectly you are providing us a reason as to why Indian companies lack scale. It's because, you know, we are not open to letting control go. Yeah. And of course, when you let control go, there are downsides to it. But it also helps you access capital. Right. And access to that capital is a prerequisite for scale. Uh, so I think indirectly that question gave us some more food for thought on why, you know, Indian companies don't have the scale that they ought to have given the size of the country's nominal GDP. And I guess the second point I'd make is that you know, the last time I looked at unlisted company data was in 2019. Uh, I'm assuming things wouldn't have changed drastically from then, but there aren't any hidden uh, Aramco's, unfortunately, in the Indian context. Uh, in fact, if you look at plus one trillion revenue companies, rupees one trillion revenue companies, I think there was one or two companies that were there. Uh, and one trillion is actually a fairly low number uh, if you look at the global context. Uh, There's one more question which says, if India is not favorably placed in the top 20 firms globally, that's the case for the opportunity and not for uh, something to be sad about. Right. Like we are doing wonders in cricket or in uh, Commonwealth Games or you know other places. Right. Couldn't with this be on the positive side that we have a lot of room to go and make our mark? Point taken. Uh, I am perhaps a pessimist. <laughs> uh, potentially, potentially, you know, uh, the glass is not half empty but is half full. Uh, and maybe, maybe not over the next 10 years, but maybe over the next 15 or 20 years, uh, this is a position that India can claim. And there's one specific question on that we are going from $3 trillion to $6 trillion economy. Obviously, you mentioned about different countries uh, where we can go to. But within Indian context, do you have any specific sectors in mind where one should look for, given the economy is going to sort of double over the next maybe few years, are there any specific pockets based on the US experience which will grow faster than the economy and would obviously have better investment uh, opportunities? Right, I think um, one, one sector that I think uh, is 
you know, in a great sweet spot in the Indian context is financials. Uh, I know the weightage is already high and a lot of people want to argue that, you know, this weightage is so high by cross country standards that the number should go down. But I think there's a fundamental reason why this weightage will remain high going forward. And that's because India has this funny situation where, you know, we as Indians save a lot. So the savings ratio that India has for our per capita income is really high. And despite that, the cost of debt capital in our country is really high. And the reason why that is the case is because banks have the capability to control uh, the flow of this money from savers like you and me to the users of capital. Uh, so essentially they can borrow from us at 4 to 5% and then lend it out at 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, and the margin is theirs to keep. Uh, and there isn't as much competition there. Uh, so it is highly possible uh, that, you know, financials as a space continues to do well. But BD, you'll have a better sense. Uh, so I'm talking about the vanilla financial space. You'll have a better sense of the new age, uh, the non-vanilla space. Uh, do you think that's also a space that grows? See, the good part is earlier the option to take exposure in financial was only lending based. And where if you are concerned with credit growth or NPAs or quality of, you know, borrowers, you'll always have concern with respect to which bank would take the hit next. Uh, over the last maybe three or four years, a lot of non-fund based financials have got listed, especially in the asset management space or insurance space or even the broking space. Mm -hmm. And that gives opportunity to play the same uh, financialization of saving story without taking exposure to, you know, the credit risk as we call it. Sure. I mean, we as asset management company, we don't take calls on credit risk. Right. right. But if you are bullish on the whole financialization aspect of uh, savings per se, mm -hmm. then I think these names might be better off, uh, you know, to take exposure in the growing pie, uh, given the whole, you know, jam trinity on the number of bank accounts and the, you know, Aadhaar and linkages which are happening. I think that's a better, sweeter spot if you are sort of more focused on uh, uh, financials per se. I mean, currently there are like four or five mm -hmm. AMCs listed over the course of next few years. I think all the AMCs will... Uh, get listed. I mean, there are two to three insurance companies, that number will grow. The penetration is anyway growing. I mean, we are super, super under penetrated, not just in MF or insurance oh. or health or anything. For everything to do with finance, we are under penetrated. The only thing we are over penetrated is gold, which I think they are trying to solve by the gold bonds. Uh, but thank you so much uh, in the interest of time. I think uh, we had a wonderful session.